ethics, and scientific integrity. What does it mean to be good? It's a different thing to say you did a good job than you're a good person. One has something to do with competence, the other moral character, and a good researcher has both. So far, we've been talking about research as if it's just a skill. You can learn to be a good competent psychologist who's able to answer the hard questions by whipping out research methods to arrive at awe-inspiring answers. But he also said that research has costs, not only in terms of resources, but also participants who come our way. So good moral psychologists protect the science as much as they serve the interests of their participants and the society they belong to. You've heard of mad scientists who wield electric cables, microscopes loaded with deadly microbes, or beakers full of chemicals that bubble and froth. Psychologists aren't as dramatic as that, but the consequences are equally deadly. A good, competent, moral researcher designs studies that enlighten us about ourselves and provide interventions that make our lives better. An incompetent, immoral researcher can waste resources, ruin lives, break societies, and undermine nations by polluting the pool of knowledge with useless and possibly even dangerous misinformation. Electricity, microbes, and chemicals may be out of sight and out of mind when they're down the drain or out the window, but ideas and their consequences stay and spread for much longer. When we do research, we make difficult decisions between the welfare of people and the contributions of our study. Ethics, in the broadest sense, are our professional values and the standards of behavior and conduct which derive from these priorities. They're not moral beliefs or statements about absolute good or evil. They're also not laws which prescribe rewards and sanctions. Instead, they're guidelines that determine what is acceptable and unacceptable when we do research or practice. Our ethical standards can be remedial, guidelines that we follow to meet what's needed by legal obligations just not to be sued. Or it can be positive, where we strive for moral excellence by actively promoting the welfare of our participants, the vigor of our field, and the interests of the societies in which we live and work. As such, the most difficult balancing act in research is between protecting our participants and maximizing the social benefits made possible by our studies. To see how we juggle these priorities, it's good for us to open with a classic case study in ethics, and then a more recent example to show how our standards have to change with the times. The Tuskegee study, which ran from the 1920s to the 1970s, aimed to understand how syphilis, a disease with no known reasonable treatment at the time, progressed and affected the health of the patient across time when left untreated. 600 black men, both already infected or deliberately infected with syphilis through the study, were recruited to observe how the disease affected them. Through the years, they were misled about the causes of their illness, some given dangerous spinal taps described as special treatments, actively barred from seeking treatment despite penicillin being discovered as treatment in 1943 and observed without any intent of intervention until many of them had died. It took until the 1970s for these ethical violations to be surfaced after years of being forced into obscurity and for the families of the participants to seek justice for such undue suffering. Knowledge about an incompletely understood disease was created, yes, but why through such a malicious means? In 2014, Adam Kramer, Jamie Guillory, and Jeffrey Hancock published the article Experimental Evidence of Massive-Scale Emotional Contagion Through Social Networks in the prestigious journal Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences of the United States of America. In this, the researchers partnered with Facebook to explore how the posts shared by our friends through our news feeds influence our emotions. To do this, we withheld either positive or negative content and observe what emotions we then express in our posts. This was done without the Facebook user knowing that their feed was manipulated to deliberately skew their feelings. When the article was published, other researchers began to ask whether the study was unethical because their unknowing participants were entered into a study uninformed, and the study finished with these users never knowing that their emotions had been purposely manipulated. The researchers argued that their procedure was not in violation of Facebook's policies, which users agreed to when signing up for an account. The Institutional Review Board for the Study at Cornell University, where the researchers were affiliated, believed that their review process did not cover Facebook as a platform, 
because the research was technically not done within the bounds of the university. The journal editors issued a statement of concern, now appended to the article, saying, It is nevertheless a matter of concern that the collection of the data by Facebook may have involved practices that were not fully consistent with the principles of obtaining informed consent and allowing participants to opt out. On one hand, the study could give insights into how our emotions, mental health, social connections, and information sharing practices have changed in the digital and social media age. But at the same time, do these implicit contexts we enter into when clicking I agree to the terms and conditions translate into automatic consent for psychological research? There are many other cases of researchers towing the line between ethical and unethical, balancing on one foot with participant protection and scientific benefits on each of their outstretched hands. Philip Zimbardo's now debunked study involving college students role-playing as prisoners and prison guards served to inform us about the effects of social roles on behavior for a time. Some obedience to authority studies where participants were made to believe that they were electrocuting a confederate who was actually just acting out were deceived about their role, but never informed about what was actually happening. Lord Humphreys pretended to be a lookout in public restrooms to study same-sex sexual activities then track down these people using their license plates, showing up one day on their doors to ask more about their sexual life under the guise of being a health service worker. When do we say that enough is enough? When is research acceptable and when does it cross the line? It was in 1979 when the United States National Commission for the Protection of Human Subjects of Biomedical and Behavioral Research formally published a document codifying the basic ethical principles which now serve as the foundation of our modern ethical guidelines. The Belmont Report We follow basic ethical principles which inform the actual practices we do. The 1979 Belmont Report listed three principles which broadly defines what we should prioritize when doing research. First is the respect for persons or autonomy. People are free agents who should be able to choose what they want for themselves. Thus, in research, we ask people to participate by seeking their informed consent. They should willingly choose to be part of a study, and they should be aware of what the study is for, what the risks are, and what to do in case they wish to stop participating. At the same time, when we do research with vulnerable populations, or people who have a decreased capacity for decision-making or personal autonomy, they should be given special consideration, such as greater protection, or giving consent through a representative who would respond in their best interest. Children, the elderly, individuals with neurocognitive disorders, people with intellectual disabilities, prisoners and people deprived of liberty, and members of minorities, such as by gender, race, and ethnicity, are all made vulnerable either by their inability to give full consent on their own, or because the situation makes them susceptible to coercion. Next, beneficence is our duty to ensure the participants' well-being and development while they are under our care or jurisdiction, and non-maleficence is to ensure that they are not harmed, that they live in better if not the same conditions they came in. Our research must not induce suffering, and we must do our best to improve the lives of our participants and society in general. Finally, justice is our obligation to treat everyone equally, distributively through the beneficial outcomes of our study, and procedurally through the experiences of research participation. When we think that our study will be most beneficial for a particular group, then we sample from that population and ensure that they will be the first recipients of any positive outcomes from our research. We never do research just to get data and give interventions unequally to those who might benefit from it. As we can see, these principles apply to all researchers across all disciplines as long as they conduct studies with human participants. In 2002, the American Psychological Association expounded on these principles to clearly identify what is expected of psychologists and added two more core principles applicable to research and practice. So, the fourth principle we abide by is fidelity and responsibility. As psychological professionals, we hold a position of trust, and so we respect the relationships we have with our co-researchers, clients, students, everyone really, in our being psychologists. So, when we act as psychologists, 
We make sure to be responsible and accountable for what we do, whether it is research, teaching, or clinical practice. Finally, we need to have integrity. We keep our knowledge up to date and accurate by reading up on the literature. We attend training and undergo further education to hone our skills. We make sure that we are transparent and honest about what we know and don't know, and we hold ourselves to the highest standards in our roles as psychologists. The Psychological Association of the Philippines adopted similar standards for local psychologists in 2008 and revised it in 2018, identifying specific guidelines for clinical and counseling practice, psychological assessment and measurement, education, and research. So, wherever you are and whatever you do, if you're a psychologist, you should act like an ethical one too. We do a lot of things to promote participant welfare and scientific integrity. Now that we've seen the principles, how do we act on them? We have specific practices that are tied to each of these principles. Closely related to justice, institutional review boards or IRBs, also called ethics review boards or ERBs, are committees who review research proposals submitted by researchers working with human participants, like health and social scientists. These committees, typically composed of representatives from the academe, the public sector, and others knowledgeable in the research process, evaluate whether a particular study poses risks to participants and decide whether there are enough safeguards to mitigate these risks. In some cases, IRBs also do technical reviews, where they check if the study is rigorous, meeting standards of methodological appropriateness, in addition to being ethical. This is important because the ethics review is one way by which psychologists balance risks and benefits. If a study poses some risks such as fatigue, emotional upset, medical treatment, proposed therapies, or the need to collect sensitive information, will the benefits to the participants and society and scientific advancement be enough to balance things out? If things go wrong, what would the researchers do to turn things back? So, the Tuskegee study fails this standard. The medical insights were necessary, but it was unfair and unjust for the participants to bear the burden while being actively misled to prevent them from getting treated. To protect autonomy, we secure our participants' voluntary, knowledgeable, informed consent. This agreement, written in ways easily understood by the participant, usually indicates what the research is about, what they'll be doing, what risks are foreseeable, how their data and identity will be safeguarded, what they can do if they want to stop participating, and what the researchers can do to protect them. This document should give enough information for people to make a reasonable and informed choice whether to say yes or no to the study. Informed consent is usually asked once at the beginning of a survey, experiment, or other quantitative method. But in qualitative methods or intervention studies, for example, those testing the effectiveness of a new therapy or medication, researchers often negotiate consent to the participant across sessions to make sure that the study is still meeting their interests and goals. Despite this practice, deception is also commonly done in psychology. In this method, information about the study is withheld from the participant through omission, or the participant is deliberately given false information through commission. Deception is usually done in studies involving sensitive topics where participants might be wary of providing honest answers, or when the study might have an obvious goal and they don't want participants to guess it. So, at the end of their participation in the study, participants who were deceived are required to undergo debriefing, where researchers inform participants about the true nature, purpose, and design of the study, which we call dehooksing, and we establish thus and correct any negative effects the deception might have had, which we call desensitizing. In some cases, the debriefing process can have beneficent effects because they give people further insight into the nuances and processes of doing research. With the same effect, David Pittenger recommends a strategy used in randomized control trials where clinical patients are given either the treatment or a controlled placebo. In these studies, you add information to the informed consent saying something like, the study could only be done if we hold some info from you for now, but this info is not related to any benefits or risks. We'd be happy to tell you about all of this at the end, just not now. This so good? Make it more sciencey and at least inform the person that reasonably we can't tell them everything. I mean, would you sit down while a researcher reads out their entire proposal to you? They didn't think so. There are other ways by which we promote beneficence. We handle the data of participants while ensuring that it doesn't get leaked and used for purposes other than those that we told the participants we would. 
Anonymity is when we don't collect information that identifies our participants, which can include their name, address, or contact details. Other information like age, general location, school, or work can appear general enough, but when taken together, we can actually triangulate the one person who has all these details. In other cases, you need to collect personal information as part of a study, for instance in a longitudinal investigation. What we do then is to promote confidentiality. We limit the availability, access, and use of data to researchers involved in the study who then swear with their lives and their being but that data will not be used outside the research context at the risk of penalties or imprisonment. I'm not kidding, that Data Privacy Act really says these things. But the point is that data is powerful. Particularly for sensitive information, data can pose significant risks to a person's economic security, legal rights, reputation, and life. So, we do things like sealing physical data in secured containers and storage places or encrypting digital records. We go through the trouble of doing all these because we want to avoid harming our participant in any way, including psychologically and emotionally, in respect of their right for non-maleficence. And if they experience harm or suffering while they're with us, it's our responsibility to do everything to reverse these negative effects, restore them to their previous state, and hopefully part with them in better terms. While the practices under these first three principles focus on our relationship with the participant, We'll discuss the last two as we apply to research. To promote fidelity and responsibility as well as integrity, we try to admit to the limits of what our research can do, give credit where credit is due, base our conclusions on what the data actually tell us, and strive to contribute high-quality research in the service of science and society. Because of this, we avoid what Robert Rosenthal calls hyperclaiming and causism, where we exaggerate the goals and possible benefits afforded by our study. When we are dishonest about what our research can do, we can deny other more deserving studies of resources they need to deliver the greater impact we're capable of. At the same time, we don't misrepresent our contributions to the study. We give proper authorship credits depending on how much each person in our team contributes and recognize the previous work done by researchers by citing them properly as to avoid plagiarism. We don't misrepresent or report false findings by making sure that we do accurate data collection and analysis. We don't commit research fraud, inventing non-existent findings through data falsification, changing values to fit our expectations, or data fabrication, creating supporting data entirely. Finally, when we publish, we withhold research of low quality so we don't end up misinforming anyone, but we report even when things go wrong for our studies, not just what went nicely, so other researchers can learn from our mistakes and limitations. We don't publish a work that has been released before and pretend as if it's new. And we acknowledge our interests that could have influenced how we did our studies, like who funded us and who contributed to our research. After all of these, you might think that there's too many things to consider when doing research. And you're right. A well-designed study looks at scientific rigor, participant welfare, and social implications simultaneously. The science we do as psychologists is situated in our social and cultural contexts, and so it makes sense for us to check if our endeavors are doing justice, not only to our science, but also to our society. The replication crisis in psychology can be explained by our limitations in meeting the standards of ethical and rigorous scientific inquiry. As shown by our opening case studies, our long history with ethically questionable studies have brought ethics into the forefront of our considerations when planning studies. What about scientific rigor? Well, in the recent history of our fields, many high-profile studies celebrated in psychology seemed to fail when they were done again. We're good at seeing where things failed in hindsight. Many researchers have been sounding the sirens that we need to rethink how we do research. Then the problem appeared to be as important across fields of the life, social, and behavioral sciences. This is the replication crisis in psychology, and we'll look at a short introduction to what happened because this issue is now a whole field called meta-science and meta-psychology, which we don't have the time and space to tackle in full. You'll typically see this crisis in two names. Replicability is the act of running the same study again to tie and get the same results as in the original. It can be direct, using the same stimuli, measures, procedures, and processes as the original study, conceptual, where we alter our approach and operationalization to see if the concept can be targeted in a different way, or replication plus extension, 
where you do the study again, but with new variables. Meanwhile, reproducibility is taking the original data set and reanalyzing the data to verify if the findings can be achieved again and check if it was just an inaccurate analysis that led to false findings. When people write and talk about this issue, they tend to use the terms interchangeably though. So, why do findings fail to replicate? The original study could have problems such as low internal validity or poor controls for confounds, ineffective or invalid measures and manipulations, a small sample size leading to a study that's not powerful enough to detect true effects, or engaging in questionable research practices. These include fishing for significance, doing many statistical analysis until something significant is found, p-hacking, collecting data and watching the results until they return significant, hypothesizing after results are known, harking, or running the analysis first, then writing the report around significant findings, or reporting only significant findings and censoring those that aren't. At best, the original study wasn't designed well enough to detect findings, but at worst, the original findings might have come by chance or contained by fraud. Meanwhile, replications themselves could have problems. The replication could have used the original research design, which doesn't have good external or ecological validity, so they don't work in all settings, or the replication didn't have a sample size that's large enough to detect effects. At the same time, the academic publication culture prioritizes significant, novel, and interesting studies while they emphasizing non-significant findings and replication attempts, even when they are more rigorous and provide more reliable findings. Thus, how we publish studies actually contributes to the replication crisis because it can incentivize quick but questionable studies which are useful for securing funding, tenure, and career advancement while compromising scientific accuracy. You might be asking, are we doomed? Not yet. In recent years, there have been stronger calls for methodological reforms that aim to change how we do statistics and research. Replications now have invited sections in prestigious journals, and some publishers devote entire collections to replication attempts. Stricter standards of research planning and reporting are being implemented, such as including sample sizes determined through power analysis, detailed reports of data analysis, pre-registration, and making public research plans before conducting them so researchers are bound to follow their proposal, open science and making data and procedures accessible to other researchers for checking, and meta-analysis and meta-synthesis, which revisit existing research to give us a more comprehensive view of what we know. It's hoped that this turn toward transparent and rigorous research practices would also change what journals prioritize when publishing studies. There are many problems compromising the rigor of psychological research and we respond by providing incentives and guidelines for high-quality research. But you also play a role as consumers of psychological research. When we encounter works in scientific journalism, articles written with the everyday public in mind, we should be critical about how accurately these reports actually summarize the findings of the studies we're reporting on. And even if it's published in a journal, we still have the responsibility to hold researchers to high standards of quality. Psychologists do research with humans for humans, and it only makes sense to ask for humane, vigorous, and impactful studies. Ethics and scientific integrity are tied together in ways that should be clear now. When we conduct studies, we juggle the priorities of protecting our participants, holding ourselves to high standards of competence and quality and foreseeing how our study can be used to improve society. We saw how basic ethical principles translate to specific research practices and demonstrated how ethics and scientific integrity can be used to understand and possibly resolve the replication crisis. With the end of this lesson also comes the end of our series Introducing Research in Psychology. Across seven episodes, we learned about why research is important and how we can make sense of research reports, considered how our theoretical and philosophical assumptions shape our choices of approaches and methods, and discovered why reliability, validity, sampling, generalizability, ethics, and scientific integrity should always be at the top of our considerations when planning, conducting, reporting, and evaluating psychological research. I'll leave the last word to the American alternative rock band They Might Be Giants for the song from their 2009 album Here Comes Science, put it to the test. If there's a question bothering your brain, but you think you know how to explain, you need the test. Let the question be your guide, the answer your goal. Thanks for staying tuned.